So I'm John Kutch, Executive Director of the Thorium Energy Alliance. So uh, our directive is basically to promote the use of thorium as an energy source. We do tend to get behind one particular uh, embodiment, and that is the molten salt reactor. Molten salt reactors, you know, they sort of get conflated with thorium. You don't have to use thorium. You could use uh, uranium in it, and there's a couple guys that would argue that uh, uranium would work even yet better in a molten salt reactor, but thorium has a lot of advantages as a fuel. Thorium's uh, three to four times more abundant than uranium. You get thorium for free when you're processing rare earths. And as I'm sure technical folk like you know, we can't live a modern lifestyle without rare earths. But as you also probably know, 99% of our commercial rare earths come from China. So we are at the hands of a, of a country that does not have our best interests at heart. And so uh, the Thorium Energy Alliance works very hard to also uh, get new rare earth production going in the United States in particular, or at least somewhere in the West. And by doing that, it's self-serving because we know if you're refining rare earths, you're generating probably somewhere between 2 to 7 to 14 percent uh, thorium, and you get a little uranium out of the deal too sometimes. Uh, uh, and of course, thorium is an alpha emitter. It is not uh, uh, that hard to handle. It is not water soluble. So that means you can uh, store it much more safely than you can uranium, and you can handle it much more safely. Uh, probably the biggest byproduct of storing large amounts of uh, thorium or thorium oxide of some type would be uh, uh, some radon that you could e uh, easily collect uh, and uh, deal with over probably about an 80-day period. So it's pretty good stuff. It's got a lot going for it as a fuel. It's more abundant. It's easier to handle. It's got a much happier disposition uh, than uranium or plutonium. Uh, the trouble is, and you may be wondering by the end of uh, this, uh, gee, John, that's pretty good stuff. Why aren't we using more of it? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons, and one reason I like coming to Washington, D.C., is that we're trying to get it uh, uh, so that you can use it more readily. Uh, just for your information, the 1954 Atomic Energy Act said, hey, there's three nuclear fuels out there. Thorium, uranium, and plutonium. And back in the day, that was a really good thing because it led us to being able to do work on the molten salt research reactor back in the 60s, a real honest to God, not paper reactor that ran for 22,000 full power hours at six megawatts of heat. If you ever visit Oak Ridge National Lab, you can actually see the MSRE building is still there and it's still used as an office building and the remnants of the MSR are still there. The nice thing about the MSRE in general, whether it's uranium or thorium, very, very simple and elegant. You have that yellow vertical tube there is the uh, reacting chamber, and it goes into a single pump, so you don't have triple, quadruple, quintuple, redundant cooling pumps. It goes through a heat exchanger, exchanges heat to another salt, and the salt loop either goes out and runs hopefully some sort of Brayton cycle or advanced steam cycle, supercritical CO2 something, or you go out to a heat loop and you do work with the heat because why would you lose 50% of your energy just to make electricity when instead you could probably take that nice sweet seven to 800 degree salt and use it to process maybe coal into liquid fuels, turn coal from the dirtiest, filthiest energy into maybe one of the cleanest energy sources. Uh, or maybe you could make fertilizer, desalinate water. You've all heard the stories about what you can do with high temperature process. The other nice thing about an MSRE, or an MSR I should say in general, is that that salt wants to be solid. So if it drops below 450, 600 degrees, it becomes solid. So when the terrorists fly their plane into the reactor and they crack it open, what would happen? The the fueled salts and the blanket salts would fall into the uh, curved bottom, the swimming pool there, and drain down into these storage tanks and solidify in a matter of days. If you had a little more controlled thing than a terrorist attack, if somehow the system overheated for some reason, there's a salt plug, basically just the same salt that the fuel is, and it's kept frozen 
by literally just blowing a fan on it. That's how they did it back in the 60s. They just blew a fan on a section of pipe. And if something like Fukushima happened where we lost power, the fan would stop blowing, the plug in the pipe would melt, and voila, the whole thing drains down into the containment tanks in the lower gallery. This is, and I know it's a little overused, this particular thing was an inherently safe, walkaway safe, reactor design that we've had for the last 60 years and uh, Dr. Alvin Weinberg who had a huge part in developing the light water reactor literally begged several administrations from Kennedy to Nixon to please this is what a civilian nuclear reactor should be. You should use thorium and you should use molten salts. If you want to make plutonium to build nuclear weapons that's great. Go ahead and use your solid fuel uh, reactors, you know, for that, but this would, uh, this would be the civilian reactor, the safe reactor, the inherently safe reactor. And uh, uh, just to end it, that, like I said, we're not, we're a bit agnostic though. There is great work that can be done in solid fuel using thorium. There's companies such as Thorium One in Canada. Uh, there's Lightbridge, which used to be Thorium Power here in the United States that worked very closely with the Russians to make solid fuel, MOX fuel replacement rods. And of course we have some wonderful representatives from South Africa here who want to, uh, you know, pick up where some work was left off with thorium pebble bed reactors and that's also the work that's being done by Pierre Peterson at uh, Berkeley. Uh, so there's, uh, there's, we could extend our uranium fleet using thorium. Shipping port, as many of you know, ran its last fuel load using thorium. China is putting one to two billion dollars. If you look up uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, they had a press release in 2011 and, and, and just recently Mark Helper has written about it. Uh, you can look up the Chinese Academy of Sciences is working to develop the, what they call the TMSR, the Thorium Molten Salt Reactor, and they are skipping over Gen 3. They're going right to Gen 4, and, uh, uh, and they've put real money, billion dollars. There's zero dollars in the United States being spent on this. The other place that might get this done is Canada, because they do have a huge interest in process heat. And if you look at that thing as just, a, as just a hot cell, and you get rid of that whole Brayton cycle turbine hall in the middle there, what's valuable to a lot of people is 800 degree, always on process heat that's very cheap and somewhat mobile, certainly you know, safe and efficient. And as uh, Bob said, it's, it's a zero pressure system. You could, if you took the lid off of the containment there, you know, so there's no water to flash off, you know, there's no water to disassociate. You're, you know, you're not going to have uh, uh, catastrophic events like, like that. That gets to be pretty attractive to somebody who's trying to suck tar out of the ground and they want mobile lily pads to, to do that. So the idea of a 10, 50, maybe 100 megawatt mobile reactor that could fit into a, in the back of a container system and sent to uh, sites by helicopter, that might be worth a billion dollars worth of R&D to, that's nothing to, to petroleum companies. Let's talk a little bit about thorium health physics. And these two pictures are from Fernal, the uh, Fernal Management on your Cincinnati, which happened to be the Department of Energy uh, legacy management and all of the thorium with the Department of Energy were part of the weapons program. It ended up in, in the Fernal uh, to be basically the, the repository. They put them in barrels, and uh, the barrels leaked and things like this, and so they had a big re repackaging uh, process, and so people were, had to monitor and had to suit up like this way to, 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 to deal with the thorium here. We had a quite a large staff. Part of the, we were part of the weapons program. Sorry, I was part of the weapons test program. And so uh, we had about, right now we have about 15 what I consider senior technical staff here, offices across the country. Most of our people come from the national labs. We either worked at Lawrence Livermore Lab, Los Alamos, uh, Argonne National Laboratory, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Rocky Flats, Hanford, places like that, Fernal, that actually dealt with the material here. So uh, what, uh, we are expertise in uh, health physics, radiation protection, and primarily uh, criticality too, 
and anything dealing with uh, nuclear, nuclear safety here. Uh, we work for both the government, you know, we have contracts with Center for Disease Control, it's one of the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, we have a work with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the national labs, and we work with private industry. Matter of fact, we're working with a company right now working on uh, spent fuel storage, uh, some of the issues that are showing up in spent fuel storage. Open Yucca Mountain now. I mean, okay. <laughs> uh, the goal of this talk is to discuss uh, historical interests in thorium and uh, introduce some of the health physics issues relating to specifically of handling thorium, okay? Because again, I say, not a showstopper, but let's talk about it. And I want to pass on some related experiences, uh, not only personally, of handling significant quantities of thorium and uranium-233, okay? Let me go to the next slide here. Well, as you all, many of you know, uh, the AEC, in his infinite wisdom in the Department of Energy many years ago, uh, had an interest actually in developing a molten salt thorium reactor. That was one of the first concepts for this particular reactor, to go ahead and put a thorium blanket in there. However, as, as you want, this is the picture on the top one. You guys have seen a lot of it already. It is the molten salt reactor building at uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. But the interest was just not in nuclear power. That was not the primary interest. It was funded you know, by the department, AEC at that time, and there was certainly weapons applications for it here. The bottom left is a shot uh, for called Teapot, part of the Met Test series in 1955. I was not there, but uh, certainly shortly thereafter. This used uranium-233 as a fuel. There has been several events personally involved that we actually put together U-233 and shot it, okay, and executed the event. It's called a device, not a weapon. You know, I've seen some articles that said, it's kind of mapping into a weapon. It's probably, we have never done that, but we certainly have done it in, in a device. The next one I think is of interest here. I think I stole that from one of your slides here, John. Um, Got to keep track of this one here. Um, the uh, Department of Energy um, was uh, very interested in uh, disposing of some of the legacy 232, 232 material. In this bottom picture, they spent a lot of money, 17, 20 million dollars, just to move it from Fernal and, and bury 7 million pounds of thorium, thorium nitrate, at the Nevada test site. Wow, you know, that's a lot of stuff here. It can really supply a lot of many, many years of uh, nuclear energy if we ever convert this into usable uh, energy. I want you to remember this picture because we know where it is, okay? <laughs> and if we ever want to go back and get it, we can do that. Okay, it's there. That's a good thing. So we just didn't get rid of it. It is there, okay? Retrievable? Okay, I hope so, but maybe it's not. There's also the Department of Energy and his wisdom <laughs> is spending up over... $500 million, well over $500 million, to destroy 450 kilograms of uranium-233. Yeah. Should I say that again? <laughs> yeah, I mean, infinite wisdom, our good, our good our government. You know, it's uh, uranium-233, we, we got to get rid of it. Let's downblend it, we'll do whatever the case may be, so it cannot be used for a, 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 a device or a weapon again. Well, misthinking. You could certainly use it for other things, certainly the application that you people are thinking of here, and certainly can be used to generate uh, bismuth-213 for cancer research, and, and, and primarily as a prime for an entire fleet of liquid fluorine thorium reactors. I think you've heard of that before. Okay, next slide. There's a story coming together here. Well, this is probably, I added this slide at the end. This is kind of a sensitivity issue. Uh, in about year 2000, there was a proposal that said, oh, God, we have all these old former atomic workers, you know, back in Savannah River, Oak Ridge, Rocky Flats. They're coming down with cancer, you know, and, and it must be due to the radiation, right? So there was a compensation program to get together, administered by HSS, Human Health Services, through CDC, through National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and the Department of Labor. That's why you see NIOSH. Depart DOE and Department of Labor to set up a compensation program to compensate people who came down, who were coming down with cancer due to radiation worker as a Cold War World War worker. I'm one, okay? I don't want to come down with cancer, so I don't want to be compensated. Well, anyway, what's interesting part of it is that, what this is a part of the story that I wanted to tell, is that um, the, when we first looked into it, 
he said, oh, gee, there's not that many people with a high amount of radiation uh, throughout the AEC and DOE. So if you really look at the probability of causation, there was a formula developed by the National Academy of Sciences that says you need to get this much radiation for that particular organ, then it reaches certain level or certain probability of, of coming down with cancer. So every organ had a different number, interestingly to say. Okay? As you all know, there's a latency period primarily with uh, getting radiation and coming down with cancer. I remember an old story, somebody told me, Mel, if you get cancer at 105, congratulations. I mean, you know, so, right. So this compensation, now remember, this is a compensation, it's a, it's a framework that they wrote down to try to get people to get compensated. It was $150,000 per person, by the way. Okay, and a compensation decision required that you had the ability to do dose reconstruction at a, at a significant accuracy. Significant accuracy? What does that mean? Right? <laughs> as your significant and my significant is two things. Also, in, in put into this particular legislation was the ability that your ancestors can, not, if you died of cancer working at Oak Ridge, but your ancestors could also compensate for you. So my grandfather worked in Oak Ridge or Y12, and we didn't know what he did, but he died of cancer. Compensated. Wow. Well, so they go through a whole process of how to do dose reconstruction. We get all the data. We look you guys up. We look them up. It says, oh, yes, he worked in this particular building for this amount of time. It's bad. Shows so much. What else did he work with? Well, he worked with uranium and plutonium and thorium and thorium. Well, this is where it got a little bit more complicated here, okay? Remember I said you got you to be able to do dose reconstruction for a significant ac sufficient accuracy. Reconstruct them thorium dose proved to be the most challenging. Why? Well, I'll talk about, I'll tell about why, but that's a real key statement. People who work with thorium and uh, w was potentially exposed to thorium, maybe the air sampler showed up. We couldn't see it very well. I'll talk a little bit about that very well. But the ability to do dose re thorium dose reconstruction to sufficient accuracy by some panel that was going to review it to make that decision was eligible for compensation. So external radiation became not the real issue. All the internal radiation became an issue here for people who even come in contact with thorium. Well, many of the people, especially at Oak Ridge, I was at Oak Ridge Bank in the early 60s and watched them actually process thorium and thoria. There was a lot of material coming through. They're machining it and doing all kinds of things and, and uh, arc welding, doing all kinds of things with it. And so, yeah, well, could you do dose reconstruction? Let me tell you why it was so hard to do. No questions so far, huh? Well, I'm glad somebody brought a piece of thorium with them. I think it was back there with a Geiger counter, right? Yeah, Alex is just passing it around. All you young guys here uh, don't know. I will tell you that's another story. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's barely radioactive. When I first got to Livermore, and we were getting pieces of thorium in there, we put it in a plastic bag and a hood, and that was about enough. Left it on the table here while we were working the parts. Well, it is barely radioactive. Yep. Well, just in relative numbers, thorium-232, it's about three times less than uranium-238, about 200,000 times less radioactive than plutonium per unit uh, quantity. Okay? okay? That's the real key. This is, back, this is grams. I'm going to give you some, um, a few... Uh, Health physics terms here. They lose the side. Oh yeah, the health physics term is uh, <laughs> as health physicists are our own worst enemy. We have changed units in radiation many many times. You know, there's 50 year committed doses. There's Baccarels. There's Sieverts. There's <laughs> Terra Baccarels and uh, and you know Curies. I think you guys remember what Curies were. Okay, yeah. do you remember that one? That one. But did you ever get to Baccarels? Then we had Sieverts. Now we got Gray. How about just Millerem? I mean, you know, give me a break. Right? Well, not only we confuse ourselves, we confuse everybody else too, right? So when you go up and I said, oh, you just got so many sieverts or millisieverts. My God, that's got to be bad, right? Because I didn't understand what the unit was. Well, I just want to brought that up here. Okay, that's an issue. We are our own, our own worst enemy. Thorium does pack a little bit of a punch. And here's part of the story. It starts off with thorium-232. Alpha decays with a very long half-life, 10 to the 10th year. Somebody knew that number very well at, my, at the lunch table here. It's about 
three times the age of the Earth. Well, how can it be three times the age of the Earth? But it is, okay. That's what the decay is. It decays down to radium-228, and it has several, what, five short uh, half-lives of, of, uh, of decay here. Primarily, mostly alpha decays, but through a beta, beta chain here. It comes all the way down. I think if I push the button, it gives a little ring hang up in there. Oh, yeah, it's just going in a circle. Oh, how glitzy is that, huh? Thank you, Brent. Anyway, it comes down the uh, thorium-228 chain. I want to point out the thorium-228 very clearly. That's the culprit. When we were dealing with uranium-232, uranium-233, there was a trace quantity of uranium-232. And that uranium-232's first daughter is thorium-228. Okay? But it's also one of the daughters for, uh, for thorium-232. Well, let's follow down the, the alpha decay chain here. Goes down to radium, another short fuse, or short, short half life. Then it breaks up right at bismuth here and breaks apart by an alpha decay down to a thallium 208 and a polonium 212. Well, the reason I brought up thallium 208, that's the culprit. That has a very large gamma of 2.6 MeV. I think many of you guys know that already because we talked about uranium 232 and, and thorium 232 and as part of the decay chain. But it takes a little while to get there. But the real issue is that if it has a contaminant of 232, which when we were working on some of the weapons program, it did have that contaminant. And that particular contaminant was very deal, difficult to deal with, but we only did it with, deal with it a very short time, and we just watched it grow in and then blew it up. Okay, that's what we did. Literally blew it up. Detecting thorium intake, that's breathing it. That's not that big chunk you're talking about. Pretty hard to swallow that big chunk you had in your hand there. But you break it up into little pieces, or you start machining it, you gotta do it. This is the front end of the fuel cycle. If it's in the front end of the fuel cycle, you're potentially dealing with the spur fine chips or powders and things like this. Therefore, it could be an inhalation hazard. It does take it, you can do it. A few people in the atomic energy in, in, uh, work with DOE and the weapons program did, did inhale some thorium. Hard to see though, couldn't quantify it very well because the only way, we couldn't see it through urine, we couldn't see it through uh, the feces. Number one, it's so low specific activity, and once it got into the lung, it kind of stayed there. You know, it's highly insoluble, it just kind of stayed in the lung here. We even tried lung counting. We spent a mobile laboratory up to Fernal, we set it up at Y12, to see you can see the, some of the daughters and see the gammas. Well, it obviously depends when the thorium was separated. You know, there's a very complex decay chain with thorium once you do thorium start, separation. I won't go into that. That's a whole other talk in itself. But you had to know exactly when the thorium was, when you detect it, and when they were de dealing with it. That also made it very, very difficult. And the only way you can really do uh, a, a good an assessment of what uh, the exposures were is probably by air sampling or by uh, sampling of the lapel. All of these two are very uh, too insensitive. That became the issue. That became the issue with the compensation. That we were un had the inability to do uh, accuracy of uh, thorium exposures to sufficient accuracy. And it was to form the basis for the compensation. Well, how many have there been? Okay. Well, they, the way the law was written, if anybody even had potentially come in, in contact with thorium, they walked into the building and somebody was machining a piece of thorium down the hallway here, he was eligible for compensation. Right? Wow. You know, well, I have to say this with um, a little bit of care. I think that's what the government wanted. You know, I mean, that's what the, the government wanted. They wanted to compensate the people just to get, say that, yeah, we took care of the legacy of the old Cold War war warriors. And so they developed a presidential panel uh, and, and able to make some of these particular compensation decisions. It's been going on for about 15 years. Really 10, the last strong, when we got the system going and go back and look at all the records and see what people, who was working with radiation. The program has now exceeded $9 billion. We've already spent $9 billion compensating. You not only get $150,000, but you also, if you happen to be still alive, you get your medical included too, okay? Wow. So what does it do here? My message is, John, is that it's give the people the wrong impression. Okay? I just got compensated because I, was, I walked into the building with thorium, and that's how I got cancer. Well, 
<laughs> okay, you can shake your head, obviously no on that one, right? You know, how, how can that be? Okay. Well, it is because the way the legislation was written. Exposure issues with the thorium fuel cycle. Just want to make sure we know it, and I hope we get a chance to do it. I applaud this particular group together to post a, put a program together with objectives and your goal to get fuel, uh, thorium into uh, thorium reactors, your energy as an energy source, part of the fuel cycle. I love to be part of it again. This is the Mali Core, and the Mali Core, they have a lot of rare earths. But they, as you well know, know rare earths comes along with thorium. That's where you find thorium, you find rare earths, and vice versa. It's a real nuisance to them. Matter of fact, the president of Raleigh Molly Course called me several times and just kind of cornered me, Mel, can you figure a way to get rid of the thorium? Any one of you guys want to buy it? Can you, do you have any contacts for somebody who'll take it? I know, I think we just buried it. You know, we just can't, get, we're trying to get rid of it. It's, it's a real nuisance. But it is, for the people who at Molycore, it does represent a somewhat of a potential exposure. Not big, but it is a potential, okay? Now, this is a picture of the molten salt reactor. Unfortunately, you know, we thought of using thorium, but because of they were more interested in the neutronics, they end, never end up actually putting a thorium blanket around there, but they did use 233. The 233 was made in uh, Savannah River in Hanford, so they used it directly. But the application is here. We had a lot of trouble getting this, dismantling this thing here. So that's another message I want to give. To take apart a thorium uh, U-233 reactor, we got to be careful if we, I hope we get there, right? I hope we get a chance to do that one of these days, that the radiation issues along with the 232 uh, and the gammas from the, and the fission products and things like this is going to represent a radiation exposure. I hope I get a chance to do it again, okay, with you guys. But anyway, in conclusion, thorium is not very radioactive. Five short half-life alpha emitters, packs a little bit of punch. Thorium will stay in the lung after inhalation. Detecting thorium intakes is a very challenging. External 232 are significant. Unfortunately, this is red. Health physics issues and radiological controls will need to be appropriately addressed in the thorium fuel cycle and the reactor designs. Especially if we can want to make sure we think about this, especially in designing the reactors and also the follow-on, if we ever have to decommissioning it, the back end of the fuel cycle, it's going to represent some real fun time for health physicists again. Thank you very much.